Thanks, Rebecca. Um, giving this talk right after lunch um, reminded me of the days when I was a grad student here and we had uh, brain lunches. Do we, are there any grad students here? Who's a grad student? Any grad students? Do you still have brain lunches in BCS? All right. This is, uh, so I, this was 20 years ago, but um, this is a t-shirt we had for um, our brain lunch series and it was back in the old building in E25. Uh, and those are really good days. That was 20 years ago and I was just thinking about it today. I've only been back a few times since then, but just coming back reminds me about just what a great experience it was here. Uh, the BCS department is fantastic and now having it complemented with the McGovern and the Pick Hour and all these things, it's such a, a suite of great opportunities for all you grad students. So um, it, it will just set the fundamentals for the rest of your career as it did mine and working in Peter Schiller's lab, which is just a fantastic experience. And, for the grad students here, if I have um, any advice going forward coming out of MIT, um, it's advice that Peter gave me when I was starting on my job search, which is be relentless. And that's the only advice he gave me, and it was great advice. <laughs> so what have I done since then? Um, I've been working on vision and eye movements, and uh, this symposium is fantastic too, because it's like my dream meeting. And thanks, Mayor Dad, for inviting me. Um, it, to hear all about the corollary discharge people are uh, studying and the internal models that they're using and kind of incorporating these ideas into is just amazing. And it's uh, a field that's really been exploding in the last 10 years. So it's really fun to be part of this. I study um, uh, vision and eye movements, which is um, a system that we haven't really talked about too much yet. Kathy talked about it a little bit in terms of the vestibular system and head movements. Um, I'm just going to talk about straight up eye movements today without moving the head. And the problem with eye movements when it comes to vision, or one of the problems, is that it's very difficult to um, imagine how we take the chaotic uh, images that are projected onto our retinas with each quick eye movement, something like this, um, and transform that into a stable visual percept. So we're making these uh, jerky eye movements, these saccades, about two or three times a second, and we never really notice. We never see the world as jumping around. And this is something we take for granted, but it's a difficult problem. Um, there have been advances recently in computer vision to try to um, figure out how to uh, stabilize video uh, input, for example, on the fly. Um, it's very difficult to do uh, stabilization in real time. So this is the two images I just showed you, the raw image on the left and a a, a, a typical stabilized image on the right. This requires a lot of computational power. In order to do this in real time, uh, people have uh, used methods that involve gyroscopes and accelerometers, neither of which we have in our eyes, unfortunately. And um, other methods, like computer vision methods, where you lock onto particular salient parts of the scene and track that, or use um, kind of motion flow information. But that breaks down when you get past movements of a few degrees. And for example, I can make an eye movement from this side of the room to this side of the room, and I don't feel like I'm falling over. It's, everything seems very stable to me. And there's no stabilization um, in, the, in the technical world that can accomplish that. So why is it so easy for us to perceive the world as stable? Well, the brain has an advantage. Unlike um, holding a video camera where you get the jitter and the stabilization is really trying to um, negate that jitter from handheld uh, movement or joystick movement of a security camera, for example. But the brain is not only um, trying to analyze that input, but it's also creating that jitter. It's creating those movements. So the brain, brain has an advantage. It's generating the movements that are destabilizing the image. So just a quick review of the uh, visual system. As you all know, um, uh, light enters into the retina, goes through processing starting from V1, extrastride areas, and a couple um, specific outputs from cerebral cortex that go down to the brainstem and superior colliculus, including the frontal eye field, which is one of the main outputs of the cerebral cortex. From the uh, superior colliculus, uh, signals go then down to uh, ocular motor neurons, which are akin to alpha motor neurons that contract the muscles. So this is the sensory motor pathway that we all learn in graduate school. Um, but there's a whole other half to this. Instead of um, a sensory motor path, there is a basically equivalent but opposite motor to sensory paths in the brain, including in the primate brain. Um, these motor to sensory paths come from many subcortical areas that I won't talk about. And one of the main ones, though, comes from the superior colliculus up to the frontal eye field. And it's relayed through a part of the thalamus called the mediodorsal nucleus of the thalamus. <coughs> 
Now, um, this pathway uh, arises from a part of the spirit colliculus, the intermediate and deep layers, where um, saccades are represented in vector form. So every little displacement of the eye is represented in population activity in the colliculus. And that seems to be what's sent up. Now, when I started working on this pathway, um, it was known to exist. This was one of the earliest pathways uh, delineated with um, retrograde, uh, retrograde tracing, transsynaptic tracing, uh, using herpes virus in frontal eye field and looking back two synapses. So we knew the anatomy was there. And that was about 1994 when that paper came out. That was at the tail end of my grad student career. So for my postdoc, I decided to try to figure out what this um, anatomical pathway might be doing. And I've been studying it ever since. So our hypothesis when I started in Bob Wirtz's lab as a postdoc at the NAI um, was that maybe this is one of the um, long elusive pathways for corollary discharge in the primate brain. So it's well situated to, to send um, information about saccadic eye movements up to this high level visual area, visual and oculomotor area of the cerebral cortex through the thalamus. But going into this, we didn't know if it actually did that. So our hypothesis was that this pathway may help the visual system to account for self-movements of the eyes by providing the visual system with predictive information about where the eyes are going to go next and when they're going to move. And with the magic of internal models that I don't particularly study myself, um, that can be converted into a, a prediction of what the scene will look like after the eye movement and a comparison can be made. And if everything checks out, then you perceive the world as stable. If there's a mismatch, you don't. That's the general idea. So in this particular system, to make it really clear, the superior colliculus is sending down motor commands to premotor neurons that actually move the eyes. And our idea is that it sends a copy of these motor commands back up to the cerebral cortex. Um, and the frontal eye field seems to have a rather privileged access to this information. This pathway from the intermediate layers of the colliculus does not reach a parietal lobe, for example. Now, we don't know if this is the actual branch of the descending uh, efferin output, as was uh, talked about earlier this morning. Um, it probably isn't. It may be separate neurons projecting in both directions. That's unknown at this point. So to study this pathway, we used um, a variety of uh, classic methods uh, in awake behaving monkeys. Um, we would record from single neurons, and we could record at all three levels of this pathway, at the source, at the relay, and at the target. Um, but every neuron that we recorded from was identified as being part of the pathway by combining the recordings with electrical stimulation methods. Um, and with the electrical, so we would have the uh, stimulating electrodes implanted with their tips in the intermediate layers of the colliculus or in the frontal eye field. And those are semi-chronically implanted for a couple months. And then on a daily basis, for example, we would record from mediodrosothalamus and try to find the relay neurons. You've seen a little bit about uh, these methods this morning at, using um, anadromic activation, also orthodromic or synaptic activation. So whenever we encountered a neuron in thalamus, we would try to drive it synaptically from the colliculus. And at this, also then we'd switch over and try to drive it antidromically from the frontal eye field. And if it was double identified in this way, then we knew it was a relay neuron in the pathway and not just a generic uh, thalamus neuron. And we use similar methods to look at the source neurons going up and the target neurons. So when we identified uh, such a neuron, we would um, run the wake behaving monkey on uh, a, a whole battery of tasks. I'll just talk about one, the memory delayed saccade task, which you're probably familiar with. Um, monkey uh, fixated a spot in the screen, like right there. And then another spot, I, can't, I don't have two laser pointers, but imagine that staying there. Another spot flashed in the periphery in the receptive field, and then, um, a little flash, and then after a while, after about a thousand milliseconds randomized, a uh, fixation spot disappeared and the monkey makes a saccade in total darkness to the remembered location. So you can look at um, neuronal activities um, aligned to many different events in a task like this. Uh, I'll just talk about the activity that's aligned with making the saccade itself. If this pathway from colliculus to frontal eye field is a corollary discharge pathway, then it should send predictive information up to the frontal eye field. In other words, it, shouldn't it should send neural activity that's not just responding to making a saccade, but is in advance of the saccade, and should um, describe the type of saccade that's going to be made, the vector of the saccade as well. It should send both what, uh, where and when information. And so recording from the relay neurons in mediodarsothalamus, that is exactly what we found. 
so this shows example activity from one uh, double identified relay neuron aligned to um, the target onset, the delay activity during the memory period, and this is the cue to move, and then this is aligned with the saccade initiation. So the activity is pretty quiet until about 80 milliseconds before the saccade starts. And before the eye even budges, um, the activity starts accelerating, and it peaks right at the time of the saccade. And each tick here is about 100 milliseconds. This is another neuron just to show that um, while most of the neurons had this um, predictive activity with respect to the movement, some also had visual activity and other types of activity earlier. And this is typical of what you would find in the source structure, the intermediate layers of the colliculus. So the relay neurons seem to be um, sending the information pretty faithfully up to the frontal eye field. So the timing's right, and we also looked at the spatial aspects of the movements, and um, the neurons also coded for specific vectors of movement. So these neurons had movement fields. In other words, they would fire for certain ranges of um, vectors of saccades, starting from the center, but not for other ranges. So very specific information about when the saccade would start and where it would go. And this is true for about uh, three quarters of all the neurons that we studied in the, um, in the pathway in the thalamus. Also true for the source neurons and the recipient neurons, which I'm not showing here. So the first major result, um, just going in, studying this well-defined anatomical pathway and seeing what is the information actually carried in this pathway was that there's a strong component of movement-related movement, movement -related activity being sent up to the frontal eye field. It looks a lot like what you'd expect to be going down toward the muscles, but it's going the wrong way. It's going up instead. So um, therefore, this pathway, first of all, sends predictive information about saccades to the frontal eye field. Then we asked, well, um, does this information actually represent any saccade that could be made? Each superior colliculus, so there's two of them, of course, on either side of the brainstem, um, each one represents only half of the visual field and only half of the movements that could be made, the movements made into the contralateral space from that colliculus. Um, so everything I've talked about so far is all homolateral pathways, so from, for example, the left colliculus to the left frontal eye field. But we also asked, is there any crossover? We knew that there's some, uh, anatomically, there appeared to be some evidence for crossover from the other colliculus to um, a frontal eye field. So for example, from the right colliculus to the left frontal eye field. So we also asked if, if that was a, um, a functional pathway. And if it were, then that would um, indicate that a single frontal eye field is receiving information about saccades made in, made in any direction, which is very useful for internal models that are trying to use the information for updating um, visual representations. Um, so to do this study, we recorded from the frontal eye field, so now we're recording from the target zone of these pathways. And we put simulating electrodes in both colliculi, and we would alternately stimulate one colliculus or the other colliculus and see if we could orthodromically drive the neurons that we recorded from in a single frontal eye field. Um, so I'm just going to show you the response fields of neurons in the left frontal eye field of um, subjects that we did this experiment on. Um, so if, if you're recording from the left frontal eye field and you can synaptically drive an, the neuron from the left colliculus, so the left colliculus, left frontal eye field, everything's aligned, everything should be representing contralateral space. And that's what we found. This is just the average receptive field over 27 neurons that we could drive in this way. Um, and this is just act, the general activity of the neurons, the visual and motor responses, compared to the baseline firing rate of those neurons with respect to space. Um, so these neurons are very nicely tuned for contralateral space, highly significantly, just like you would expect. And this is typically what you'd find for just if you're just in the frontal eye field randomly recording neurons without looking at their um, uh, connections. So everything's contralaterally tuned if it's driven from the same side colliculus. We would find occasionally some neurons that were driven only from the other colliculus, from the contralateral colliculus. The right colliculus is representing left visual space and leftward movements, which is the wrong side for the frontal eye field that we're recording from. Nevertheless, um, in neurons that could be just sitting right next to the other neurons, um, uh, when we identified them as receiving input from the other side of the uh, brainstem colliculus, they were actually tuned for ipsilateral space, the wrong direction. Um, so uh, this supported the hypothesis that 
the colliculus information is lateralized, first of all, but that both colliculi send information up to the single uh, half of the cerebral cortex where it could be, at least in principle, combined to give a full field representation of all eye movements. And just to show that this isn't um, some, like post psychotic activity or something strange, um, this shows the um, activity patterns, the spike density functions of all the neurons that were um, ipsilaterally tuned and contralaterally tuned in the frontal eye field. And the ipsilaterally tuned neurons were pre psychotic, uh, just like the contralaterally tuned neurons. They all looked the same. They typically had a really nice visual response, and they ramped up their activity just before the saccade and peaked at the time of the saccade. So, therefore, um, this pathway sends corollary discharge or predictive information about saccades to the frontal eye field, and it integrates this information bilaterally at a single frontal eye field. So this is all well and good, and this is correlational information. It shows that activity is in the pathway and that the activity is appropriate for being a corollary discharge signal, but it hasn't proved anything in terms of um, does this pathway or does this, these signals do anything. So the next step was to perform causal experiments where we uh, perturbed the pathway or manipulated it to see if um, the results would be as predicted from a corollary discharge um, function. So does this predictive information affect visual processing in the frontal eye field? Because our overall hypothesis is that this is advanced information that's used by the visual system um, for updating the visual scene across the CODs and stabilizing the scene. So it better at least affect visual neurons in the frontal eye field in some way. So to test that hypothesis, we um, inactivated the pathway at the relay uh, site. Um, so after mapping out the medial dorsothalamus relay neurons in a, in a monkey, we would go in and target Musamol injections. Musamol is a GABA agonist. It inhibits neurons. For a, it takes about 20 minutes onset and then lasts for about four or five hours. So we would inactivate the relay zone. Um, before we did the inactivation, we would isolate a neuron in the frontal eye field. Um, we would map out its visual properties. We would inactivate the thalamus, wait for the musmol to take effect, then keep recording from that neuron for as long as we could to compare the visual responses afterwards to before the inactivation. Now, there are a lot of different visual properties of neurons. Um, the one that we were interested in that could be linked to an internal model idea um, is a, a property called pre-psychotic remapping or shifting visual receptive fields. So you all know that many neurons in the brain have visual receptive fields, of course. And so for a typical neuron, if a monkey is fixating here, um, the monkey sees the whole scene or perceives the whole scene. But any individual neuron typically only sees a part of the scene. That's the receptive field of the neurons, for example, the boat. And for most neurons in the visual system, probably, uh, the receptive fields just simply move with the eyes, just like retinal receptive fields would. When the eye moves, the receptive field just comes along for the ride. It's a very passive receptive field. But for other neurons in the visual system, um, the receptive fields are more active. They move actually before the eyes move. And this was discovered by Jean-René Duhamel, Carol Colby, and Mickey Goldberg in 1992. So for these neurons, um, you might have a monkey fixating here and a recording from a neuron with a receptive field over the boat. But just before the eye moves in a certain direction, there seems to be a pred predictive signal arriving at that neuron because the neuron will shift its receptive field in line with the um, upcoming eye movement. And the eye hasn't even moved yet, but the neuron becomes sensitive to stimuli in a new part of space that we call the future field. Sometimes it completely uh, ha loses its uh, sensitivity at the receptive field. Sometimes it maintains in both places. But the important thing is that it moves uh, its uh, visual sensitivity before the eye moves. Then the eye moves and catches up to it, and the future field becomes the classical receptive field again. So we know that such neurons have to be receiving corollary discharge because they um, shift their receptive fields um, in specific directions depending on the eye movement that's about to occur, and they shift those receptive fields before the eye movement actually occurs. Um, so our hypothesis is that this pathway through medial dorsal thalamus is what's providing that corollary discharge information. So our prediction would be then that um, in the intact animal, before we inject the musamol, uh, a monkey would be fixating here, and um, the neuron may have a receptive field, let's say, up and to the right like this. 
And then um, corollary discharge or a predictive signal about the saccade arrives, and that's used to shift the receptive field to a new location, and the neuron now becomes sensitive to this location, the future field. So if the pathway is providing that predictive signal, then silencing the pathway should silence the predictive signal and remove the shift. So the neurons should still have their classical receptive field, but they should be unable to um, change their sensitivity just before the saccade. In order to test this, um, we used a classic um, shifting receptive field task um, that was um, published first, I think, by Nakamura and Colby in 2002. It's a very simple task. A monkey just fixates a spot shown here for a while, and then the spot disappears, new spot appears uh, in the position where, that we want the saccadic vector to go. And then after reaction time, the monkey makes the saccade to the new location. They do that over and over again, and on each individual trial, we flash visual probes at different places and times to test the sensitivity of the neuron. So we may flash a little visual probe that's task irrelevant, a little white probe, the monkey's not allowed to look at it. Um, either early in the fixation, when there shouldn't be a shift, should just be a, a classical receptive field, or late in the fixation, just before the eye movement, when you should expect to see maximum shift. And we flash it either at the classic receptive field or at the future field. We also uh, flash these probes at many other times and locations that I'm not gonna talk about here, um, in between, near the psychotic target, and the flanks, and so forth. And that's all published um, in uh, previous work. And I'm just going to talk about these four conditions. Um, so uh, this shows typical activity of a neuron in the frontal eye field that we recorded from um, during an inactivation. The icons up here just remind you of what the task is. Um, basically just making a scod down to the right, <coughs> flashing probes at different times and places. If we flash the probe um, long before the scod during early fixation, um, if we flashed it at the receptive field, the neuron had a, a vigorous visual response. That's the receptive field of the neuron. If we flashed it in the future field location, by definition, the neuron had no activity because this is outside of the classical receptive field of the neuron, and it's a long time until the eye movement is going to occur. If you flash the probe just before the saccade, um, and to do this, you actually flash it at random times after the cue to move because the reaction time, with the reaction time variability, you never know exactly when the saccade is going to happen. Um, but on average, for probes flashed about 70 milliseconds before the saccade, and, and they disappear before the saccade is made, so there's no smearing of the visual information on the retina or anything like that. Um, this particular neuron still had a response at the receptive field, but now uh, it was vigorously responsive for probes flashed in the future field as well, whereas before it wasn't. So this is a, a, a typical shift that you would see in the frontal eye field. Again, some of the neurons also would completely have their receptive field um, uh, activity eliminated. But for two-thirds of the neurons, I would say you get this bimodal effect. Now, um, when you re so we record from a neuron, we um, uh, document its shifting receptive field, then we inactivate the pathway. And remember, our prediction is that this activity should go away, but th this activity should stay. So when we retested this neuron after inactivating the pathway, uh, first of all, um, receptive field activity was still fine. The neuron didn't just go blind or anything. Um, but the future field shift um, went way down. It was never completely eliminated, um, but in this particular case, for example, it went down by almost 80% of its original uh, activity. Uh, this was true in the overall population that we studied during the inactivation. Uh, receptive field activity didn't go down significantly, but future field activity went down by about half. Whether you look at whether you just average all the um, uh, raw firing rates of the neurons or if you normalize them just to look at the percent of deficit for each individual neuron, to, regardless of its um, firing rate strength. Um, so on average, there's about a 50% deficit when you inactivate this pathway. So there seem to be other pathways probably um, that are contributing as well, but this pathway seems to be um, if not the majority, uh, at least half of the corollary discharge that these neurons are receiving. So um, we also know that this pathway does something. Uh, it influences visual processing in the frontal eye field, the specific kind of visual processing of the pre-psychotic remapping or the shift 
So finally, um, we, we've started to ask, well, how, do, how exactly does this happen at the level of the cerebral cortex? When the corollary discharge arrives in the frontal eye field, it's somehow combined with visual information that's arriving from extrastriate cortex. Um, both of these inputs arrive at layer four in the frontal eye field. Layer four, uh, frontal eye field has a pretty good layer four, pretty good granule layer. It tapers off as you go down into the sulcus, but in general, um, it has a really nice layer four. Layer four neurons can be excitatory, they can be inhibitory, there's a whole mixture. And the question we asked next was, if you just look at those layer four neurons that are receiving the visual and the corollary discharge information, can you tell something about um, how the information is combined if you compare the signals of the neurons with their putiful, putative morphologies, whether they're putatively inhibitory neurons or excitatory neurons or things like that? We, unlike in slice experiments and in a lot of preparations, we can't actually see the neurons that we're recording from, so we have to use other techniques to um, infer what types of neurons they are. So first of all, we um, identified neurons in layer four of the frontal eye field using, um, again, orthodromic activation from the colliculus. Um, the meter of thalamus projects primarily to layer four and a little bit of deep layer three. So when we would identify neurons in the frontal eye field that could be orthodromically activated from the colliculus, um, we would then test the monkey on the shifting receptive field task and ask whether these very first neurons in the circuit um, shifted their receptive field or not. And again, these neurons have an unknown morphology. Um, a priori, it, they could be either excitatory or inhibitory. Both types are in layer four. To try to infer the morphology, we would compare the recorded neurons, the uh, layer four neurons, with neurons in the same structure, the same frontal eye field, with a known morphology. Um, the neurons that we could anadromically activate from the colliculus, these are all layer five pyramidal neurons. Um, the only neurons that, in frontal eye field that project down to clickless are large pyramidal neurons in layer five. So to do this analysis, we would look at the action potential waveform. I think most of you are familiar with this idea. Um, for an individual neuron, you look at the waveform and you basically measure its width. Now, every paper on the subject measures width in a different way, and so we used all of them. <laughs> and we combined the width measurements in a, into an a aggregate index that we call an inhibitory index. This just shows two example waveforms of a putative inhibitory neuron versus a wider, um, actually this is a known pyramidal neuron, using a single width. Um, to cut to the chase, um, of all the neurons we recorded from in layer four, they segregated pretty well according to this inhibitory index where zero would be no evidence that the neuron's an inhibitory neuron, and, and one would be a strong evidence that the neuron is an inhibitory inner neuron. Again, compared to this calibration set of known pyramidal neurons. Um, so we just segregated this into putative excitatory neurons, 11 of them, putative inhibitory neurons with narrow, narrower waveforms and actually higher spontaneous firing rates too. And then there were some in the middle that were not classifiable in this way. We call these ambiguous neurons, and we don't know what they are. And then we tested, as we recorded from these neurons, a monkey did the shifting receptive field task. What we discovered was that each type of neuron in layer four actually conveys a component of the shift. It doesn't convey the full shift that you would see in uh, layer five, for example. The putative excitatory neurons, um, they changed their visual response just before a saccade was made, but they changed it at the receptive field only. They didn't have any future field response, but their um, change at the receptive field was an increase in activity at the receptive field just before the eye movement. The ambiguous neurons were the really interesting ones. Unfortunately, they were also the scarcest ones, but they were the only ones, and all of them did this. They changed their visual response at the, front, at the future field. They were the only ones that showed a shift. Putative inhibitory neurons, we were excited about probably par parvalbumin positive, classic um, uh, fast spiking neurons. They didn't do anything. So they had a beautiful, they all had receptive fields, but they neither changed the receptive field um, before the movement at the receptive field location or at the future field location. It just retinal type locked receptive fields. In contrast, we also recorded from layer five neurons, as I mentioned, to use as a calibration set. <laughs> 
um, for doing this sorting. And um, we also ran these neurons on the shifting receptive field task. And as the population level and for most of the individual neurons, they showed the whole shift. In other words, they had the classic um, profile of decreasing their activity at the receptive field and at the same time increasing their activity at the future field. So both, all the components combined. And we published this a couple of years ago. So what we think, kind of the simple way to look at this is that you have all the, you have the pieces of this process at the input layer, layer four, where the visual information and the corollary discharge is initially combined. And at the microcircuit level or maybe at a larger network level, this is then uh, progresses into the full process of the entire um, pre-psychotic remapping um, phenomenon. So in conclusion, um, we've been elucidating a neuronal pathway for seeing while moving. Um, stabilizing the visual input from moving sensors is a hard problem. Um, and at technical level, people are getting close to being able to do this, but the brain does this flawlessly. The brain's solution is to use, at least in part, this pathway from a brainstem saccade-related area, the superior colliculus, that um, ascends to the frontal eye field, which is at the apex, one of the apexes of apices of visual processing in the cerebral cortex. So what we've shown um, is that this pathway conveys saccadic signals. So it's not sending weird signals like just visual signals or silence. It actually is conveying saccadic signals of the right timing and um, directional selectivity to the frontal eye field. It conveys from both sides of the motor brainstem in order to provide full field coverage of the workspace for the eye movements. It does influence visual operations in the target area, and um, it's probably doing this via local microcircuits in layer four, progressing to layer five, probably through uh, layer two, three, of course, which we haven't studied. So just some implications for the, in the context of um, this symposium, um, we're all familiar with the idea, again, of sensory motor uh, transformations. And we know that in the primate brain, there are many uh, different visual motor levels, from the retina through extrastrike cortex um, to the output nodes of the cerebral cortex, including frontal eye field, where si uh, signals are sent down to the brain stem, both the colliculus and also the pons, which I didn't talk about today. Um, from the colliculus, signals are sent to the pontine circuitry, um, that does all the timing of the muscle contractions. And finally, it's all combined at the motor neurons that innervate the muscles. So it's classic visual motor transformation. Anatomically, we know that each of these kind of coarsely defined levels um, projects backwards, but it only projects to the immediately preceding level. So motor neurons have collaterals that go back, but they only go back as far as the pontine circuitry that does the timing of the saccade. They don't reach the superior colliculus as far as we know. The pontine circuitry, however, the pons and the um, uh, reticular formation, they do send uh, feedback to the superior colliculus, putting superior colliculus in the loop in, of the psychotic generating uh, circuits. But as far as we know, they don't project up to the cerebral cortex. Um, there hasn't been any well-defined anatomical evidence for that yet, to my knowledge. The superior colliculus, on the other hand, uh, the intermediate layers do project through this uh, thalamic-mediated pathway to the frontal eye field. And the frontal eye field, of course, has a lot of reciprocal projections to the areas that supply it with visual information, such as to the parietal lobe and LIP. So there is definitely corollary discharge flowing in this um, overall system, but it's not going all the way from the motor neurons to the visual system. What we see from the anatomy and from studying this one uh, link of the chain uh, physiologically is that there seems to be um, a progression of corollary discharge signals from stage to stage, each probably speaking its own language. So all the motor neurons know about is muscle contractions. They innervate certain muscles and they contract them for a certain amount of time. Really, they can't even talk to the superior colliculus, which is all about space and vectors of movement. But they can talk to the pontine circuitry, and they seem to do so with their collaterals. The pons is all about timing, and they can um, send information back to the colliculus, which has some dynamics information. The colliculus is a big spatial map of the workspace, and so is the frontal eye field. So these two can talk to each other in, a, in the spatial code. And the frontal eye field in cerebral cortex is a little more abstract, kind of at the more cognitive level of planning. And they probably, uh, the frontal eye field is probably receiving this information 
We don't know what these uh, feedback projections do, but they may be involved in um, uh, more planning-related aspects of attention, motor preparation, things like that. All of this I would consider to be corollary discharge, but perhaps in a different way than is classically thought. So corollary discharge we know, and we've heard about a lot today. It's essential for internal models of perception and action. But what is it exactly? Um, it's certainly not a signal sent from alpha motor neurons to sensory areas, and we've seen that again and again. Um, even in invertebrates, there's very little, little evidence for such a direct connection. In the primate brain, it seems to be a series of signals sent through a chain of circuits. So just, I want to leave you with this. While it's useful to discuss internal models for vision in broad terms, like one block diagram representing all of vision and the movements and how it feeds back, um, these serial corollary discharge signals suggest um, that there may actually be multi-stage models that so each solve distinct problems in their own language, whether it's muscles or timing or space. And since I'm not a modeler, I pose that as a challenge to the modelers out there to uh, try to incorporate this into their ideas. Thank you. <laughs>